As I say, good morning, and I'm delighted um, to welcome you to our webinar this morning um, in such huge numbers. We've more than 100 people have signed up to the um, to this Birds, Bees and Trees Biodiversity um, in Waterford Council. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you here to the, the webinar this morning with the Waterford Council staff. It's part of our Biodiversity on Your Doorstep series, Learning from Nature events, and the, the events will run all week and they've been organised by Waterford Libraries, Europe Direct Waterford and our Environmental Department. I'm going to introduce you to our panel today. Um, first, you will hear from Bernadette Guest. Bernadette Guest is the Heritage Officer with Waterford City and County Council, and she works on biodiversity through public events, through planning policy, and through projects both within the local authority and in the wider community. Bernadette's talk today will look at how we can enhance biodiversity in our local area and the resources available to help us to do that. We'll then move over to Ella Ryan. Um, Ella is our Environmental Awareness Officer, also with Waterford City and County Council. And Ella works largely with schools, tidy towns groups, and various community organisations. Um, Ella's work would, would cover a range of environmental issues, including biodiversity biodiversity. And Ella's talk today will explore how some of the projects she's working on with schools and across the wider community. We'll then go to Owen DeLay. Owen is the horticulturalist with Waterford City and County Council, and he works within the Parks and Open Spaces section. Um, Owen's talk this morning, which is titled Waterford's Partnership with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, um, will bring you through the efforts to support and promote biodiversity that are happening in the management of our parks and open spaces. So I, um, there'll be a short presentation from each of the three speakers, and then we'll come back um, to the, the, the panelists for um, a Q&A session. So thank you very much for joining us, and I will now hand you over to Bernadette. Thanks, Claire. Um, so good morning, everyone, and uh, great to see such a, a huge interest um, in today's topic. Um, so I'll just bring up my screen here. And second okay okay so um i suppose now that we're continuing to work from home to teach from home and um, walk within our 5k for leisure and recreation um and it's coming into springtime i think definitely we saw on, on sunday and monday great beautiful springtime weather not so much today but it's um it's a good opportunity i suppose to engage with nature and over the next few I'm going to talk about ways you can do that and also what resources are out there to help you um, both notice nature and also practical actions you can take to enhance biodiversity in your local patch. Um, in May 2019, the government declared a, a, a national emergency on climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes in the media, that latter part of the message gets lost in that, you know, a lot of focus is on climate change, which obviously, you know, we're seeing every day. Um, but on, a, on an individual level, I think sometimes you may feel powerless, you know, what, what can I do to, to stop the melting of the polar ice caps? Um, so, you know, with climate change as an issue, I think on an individual level appears overwhelming and remote. Whereas biodiversity, no matter if you're in an apartment with a window box and bird feeder, or you have a, a, a grand garden with mature trees, everyone can do something that, that can have nature on their doorstep. Um, so I suppose in that context of biodiversity loss, again, we don't have to go as far as the Amazon or, or the Arctic ice caps. I mean, if you just think for a minute, like some of these species uh, that they were very commonplace in my youth, when did you last see them? So for example, a, a hairy molly caterpillar, um, a yellowhammer, a grasshopper, a lapwing, even a frog or a beetle. Um, these are all quite common, but not so much now. And there, there's a term that ecologists use called shifting baseline syndrome. And basically what that means is that every generation that looks around them sees that environment as the norm, whereas an older generation will say, gosh, that, that's far from, from the normal. So for example, in the 1970s, when I was a child, my dad, who was a farmer, um, I would hear talk about, you know, he never saw, he never sees partridges anymore, or here's woodcock or corncrake. And to me, these were very exotic birds because they, they certainly weren't in my um, environment. Um, and then as I grew up, I suppose, wetland wagers that would have been quite common, you know, you, you hear that plaintive cry of the curlew over a bog or, or the wetland. Um, curlew, snipe, lapwing, greenshank, the, all those populations of those wetland wagers have been decimated in the past 30, 40 years um, because their habitats, meadows and wet grasslands have shrank. Um, so, you know, while, while you will hear them this time of year because we have lots of, of visiting wagers, our resident populations, you know, have, have really depleted so much. Um, uh, uh, nest and, and breed anymore in Ireland. 
So it begs the question of going forward in the 2020s, like what were our children, grandchildren, what will there be shifting baseline syndrome? You know, I mean, like, Will they, for example, tell their children, gosh, you know, when we were young, you know, we'd hear bird song very commonly. We had robins and blackbirds and blue tits in the garden and we don't hear them anymore. And that, that's, that's quite a bleak prospect. Um, but I suppose that's what we're talking about when we talk about biodiversity loss. Like it is the immediate and it is the urgent. Um, I would say it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, when I was young, I never saw a barn owl or a buzzard or a martin. But thankfully, in the past five or eight years, I see them quite commonly. Um, and that's because, you know, management practices have changed. So we're not laying the awful poisons that we did back in the 70s and 80s that, that killed those species. Um, so, you know, as we learn, as we are educated and get more information and, you know, look to how we can manage these species, you know, we, we, can, we, we can hold biodiversity loss. So, you know, that is, that is the challenge um, that, that's put up to us. So again, why are species being lost? Well, they're being lost because their habitats, the places that they, they nest, that they feed in, that they, they breed in are, are being squeezed out. And why is that? I suppose if you think on a global scale, we have now a global population of 8 billion people. Um, we've all come to expect a certain standard of living. And you know, that requires resources for food, for fuel, for, for building, um, which requires land and land is, is habitat. So um, lots of habitats, I suppose, are, are being lost. And if you think of the Irish context, I suppose a big change in the landscape has been the, the, the intensification of agriculture. So the milk quota was lifted uh, what, about five years ago. And naturally enough, farmers want to improve their profit margins and you know, you, you can and to blame them for that. Um, that. That's what the system encourages. So it would have been seen as waste ground in agriculture terms, things like, you know, scrub, wet woodland, wetlands. They're, they're now seen as, you know, um, areas for, that, that can be converted to, to dairy pasture, that, 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 um, that, ho that hollow ground of, of rye grassland. Um, but they're in fact habitats. So nature has been squeezed out unfortunately and I suppose you know we need to find places now that we can squeeze back in nature and if you think of our gardens or, or, or front and, and back gardens the, in, in Ireland there are over two million gardens in Ireland so that's a huge land holding it's, it's about 359,000 acres um, but unfortunately a lot of gardens are actually uh, to the left the picture on the left there uh, there are these swathes of lawns that people take great pride in um, which are really you know they, they look lovely and neat but they're actual deserts for wildlife um, because really and truly there's only one or two species of grass if you're lucky any time a dandelion or daisy pops up its head we're out of the ride on lawnmowers so as a result we're taking out the food um, in that garden for any uh, any species that, that would feed on it such as the pollinating insects which own and Ella will talk about later. Um, in contrast to the right of that picture on the left, you'll see um, a splendid area of, of clover, of, of dandelions, of uh, buttercup. Now that's probably been enhanced with some planting, um, but nonetheless, it just, it just serves to portray that what can be allowed flourish if you if you don't go out with your right on normal every two weeks. Um, and in that is an absolute um, oasis of food for your pollinating insects. Um, on the right of the picture then is, I suppose, you know, it's the history of the lawn is, is quite fascinating. So it goes back to the 16th century. So the, you know, the, the dukes and the kings and queens of, of England and France took great pride in having these magnificent lawns. So anyone who goes on holiday to France, this is the, the Chateau de Chambord in the Loire Valley. Um, so they took great pride in having these magnificent swathes of green space and because, you know, they, they had the, the, the servants to manicure them and they didn't need the land to, to grow food or to feed animals. So they were seen as a symbol of, you know, great political power of social status and economic wealth. And, you know, it, it's, it's quite amusing, really, that that as was, has carried on five centuries later and, you know, people still take great pride in having a half acre of, of lawn front and back that, that really doesn't do anything, but requires quite a lot of maintenance um you know with, with your either own more every two weeks um so it wouldn't be great as was if we change because it is all mindset if we change the mindset instead of feeling rich and this this, this way of half acre uh ryegrass that instead that you you allow it to flourish and that you could boast your neighbors oh look at my garden it's it's so full of of buzzing bees and insects and it's you know the sense of wildflowers and this bird song because you've allowed nature come into your garden and you know you've removed that sterile environment of the of the the high maintenance lawn so last year this wonderful book was published uh, by Juanita Brown wildlife author in conjunction with the, the Lee Church Office of Catherine Casey and it's just fantastic it's it's beautifully illustrated and it's very practical there are 10 things there that that 
that you can do to help nature in your garden. So it's everything from, as say, putting out a bird feeder if you're in an apartment or a winter box, or if you have a garden and you've lots of space and you have great DIY skills, putting in a pond for wildlife. Um, so uh, this is available from the Heritage Office. So if you want to get a hard copy, please email me at beguest at waterforcouncil.ie. Um, we did a print run last year. They flew ours. You can also download it um, from the website. Um, but you know, do email me if you'd like a hard copy. And you know, if everyone did three things from that book over the spring and summer, wouldn't that be fantastic for, for wildlife? Um, other uh, resources to help you, I suppose, uh, to upskill you in identification of nature and also things you can do in the garden is the Biodiversity Ireland.ie website. So the National Biodiversity Data Centre based here in Carrigan or in Waterford. And they're, they're a fantastic resource. And they have videos, they have planting codes, they have, you see there, all the, all the how-to guides. That Owen and Ella will be talking about the pollinators. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really made simple for you because sometimes you think, oh, biodiversity, like, what can I do? Um, but it, it's all laid out there. No matter if you have a garden or you're in a sports club or you're in the council, um, like really great things you can do. And then the swatches on the left, like and kids love these because they're, they're really colourful. So, again, as, as we're coming into spring and summer, when you're on your walk and you're beginning to notice more butterflies and ladybirds and one has three spots and one has four spots, you know, you can learn like what, what it's called. And um, it's great fun. And, and, uh, you know, you, you can learn more every every week. So other things you can do, um, I was saying we're noticing nature and I suppose, you know, if you see a squirrel or a bird and you, like you marvel at the time and you tell your family about it, that's actually a piece of biological data. So why not submit the record to biodiversityireland.ie because they, they're monitoring trends in, in birds and mammals every few years, they, they bring out a atlas. Um, so your piece of information, what you saw that morning, be it a frog, or whatever, or a flowering plant, that's all information to them on how our biodiversity Ireland is doing. So, and again, it's great for and you can get quite competitive and see how many records you can put in yourself every week or um, and you know get, get your kids involved it's great fun other things then it's, it's coming into um it's national tree week will be upon us soon so you know when i plant a tree and um, the ipcc the peatland conservation council run regular frog surveys again monitoring how the populations are doing because again the, the habitat is disappearing um neighborhood cleanups now again suppose we're restricted in that with covid um there's a, a take three for the sea campaign so again we all know that plastic in our oceans is a huge problem so when you're out and you walk you know instead of I suppose talking about the, the rubbish you know with your your gloves and litter picker bring three pieces back and if everyone did that you know it all makes a difference if, if everyone comes together um it, we, we're very fortunate we have a whole range of environmental ngos um non-government organizations and so whatever your interest is if it's general wildlife or you're interested in bats or trees or birds there's, there's an organization out there who's you know doing survey work monitoring it doing publications um in non-covid times running public walks and talks and the umbrella organization for them is the Irish Environmental Network, so IEM.ie. So go on there and, and see the different groups and, you know, maybe become a member because, you know, they, they are generally, they're, they're environmental charities, they get small amounts of funding from the government, but, you know, they could really do with their in support of membership so you know there's fantastic um, information there if you're in a tiny towns group again you know think about the pollinators and again ella and Owen will talk about these but you know not using herbicides and pesticides and pollinator friendly planting um, and then there's practical things you do if you know if someone in your family is really interested in diy or or maybe part of the men's shed group um there's nesting boxes for, for various wildlife species so the irish native honeybee society they produce they make these lovely um B boxes, so we put them up ourselves in the council in the Garden Civic offices, and then in the middle picture there, there are swift nesting boxes, and the, the West Waterford Eco Group in Dungarvan have done fantastic work on, on surveying populations of swift in Dungarvan and this more Capquin and Tallow, um, and they came to us and we agreed absolutely that let's, let's put up the nesting boxes. And if, if someone is interested in doing this and think, oh, I, you know, I don't want the mess because for some reason people are objecting to to swallows and house barns under nesting nesting in their eaves, and when you think you know these birds have flown four thousand miles from Africa. I think it's the least we can do is to give them give them a home but the, the nice thing about swifts is they they make the mess inside the box so you won't see any um you won't see any uh droppings wherever outside they, they, they make a very very uh messy nest so um that can be attractive to people and then also the, there's other nesting boxes for woodland birds and bats and um insect hotels you know so there's great things that, that the men's sheds are doing around, around the country um <clears throat> excuse me just to mention some projects ourselves that we're doing um, every year, I suppose we, we do biodiversity surveys. We've built, been building up a habitat map of the county over the past 10, 15 years. Um, so this year we're 
having more wetlands um, because again they so they're a habitat under threat from from drainage um, and the, you know they have great they have fantastic ecological value in terms of both biodiversity but also um, flood management and, and for climate change as well and I mentioned the swifts and uh, we hope to work with Birdwood Ireland on a swift survey in Waterford City and to the east of the county this year as well. So that's it. So I'm just going to leave you this lovely poster um, that was produced by my colleague in Roscommon, uh, Nolig Feeney. And it's a spring into heritage bucket list. Again, you can, you can get this online on the Heritage Council Facebook. So it's 30 ways to experience heritage. So lots of biodiversity things in there, like looking for tadpoles, listen to the dawn chorus, um, let the dandelions bloom. Ella will be talking about this. Um, you know, listening for the cuckoo calls and there's little ticks that you can, you can tick off. And it's just a lovely thing to get all your family involved in as we're getting outdoors a bit more, hopefully. And um, hopefully we'll get more freedom of movement in, in the next couple of months. So thanks very much for your interest and uh, we can take questions later on. Thanks very much, Bernadette. Um, some some fantastic resources there and some great ideas, I suppose, and, and you know, just a, a, a encouragement for us all to, to use our time at home. Um, and certainly I, I like your idea of do three things. I think that's if, if there's any takeaway, um, that's certainly it. You know, look at the resources and, and choose those three things. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Ella now. Um, Ella will just share her screen there and as I said she's going to look at some of the projects that she's working on with schools and in the wider community. You'll need to unmute Ella, sorry. Thanks. That's a great presentation to follow on from actually Bernadette. Um, yeah, it's just, I suppose a lot of what I do is to try and give people ideas of the bite-sized actions that they can take um, through our different projects that we run with community groups and schools and tidy towns through the year. Um, so I'm going to start with one of the main projects that we run with schools. Um, it's Green Schools for anyone who doesn't actually, uh, who isn't familiar with uh, Green Schools. It's a an environmental education program run internationally and it encourages whole school action on a range of environmental topics so every two years a new topic is begun and one of those topics is biodiversity so um i suppose schools do a huge range of projects through this um, and, and they love to see the biodiversity theme coming because they can see it all around them. Um, and we very much encourage biodiversity projects on local biodiversity. So kids grow up looking at giraffes and ti tigers and lions. So it's great to actually get out and look at what's around them as well. Um, and I suppose this year and last year have never been important for that to appreciate nature in your own back garden when we're all so restricted in our movements. Um, and biodiversity has just increased. Even schools who haven't been covering this theme have started to look at it this year. Um, so you can see there, pupils taking a number of different actions in biodiversity. Um, they typically do a survey of what's currently in their school when they begin this theme, and then they try and improve on inviting different types of nature into their gardens and schools through this program. Um, in the school year 2019 to 2020, um, 2,500 trees were planted by schools, 784 window boxes planted, and 243 school gardens, whether that's herbs or organic vegetables, were grown. So it's it's great to see the accumulated effect. It's very easy to think, well, it really doesn't matter if I mow my lawn or if I plant a few native um, pollinator species. So it's great to see the combined effects of all those schools working together, actually having an impact. Um, one of the things that schools also do as part of this programme is to survey, to actually see the difference in people's uh, awareness on a topic both before and after. And it's really encouraging in biodiversity, there's a huge leap every year. So when asked before um, if pupils could list three ways that biodiversity is important before 24% could list those three ways. And after taking part in the Biodiversity Green Schools program, 78% of them could. Um, so that's a massive leap by anybody's standards. And from 31% to 83% of pupils could list three ways to uh, promote or make better biodiversity. So it's those significant changes are really encouraging, I think. Um, 
one of the ways that green schools has, I suppose, adapted to homeschooling or to, to I suppose, more local education is uh, their resources on their website, greenschoolsireland.org, has a wealth of information um, from activity sheets to lesson plans and, I suppose, just information for kids of all ages. Um, and you can see there the, the pillbug, the woodlouse, um, even the most mundane of creatures on the planet uh, are fascinating when you come down to uh, this level of it. And I think especially the under 10s love the creepy crawlies, the mini beasts, and there's nothing like getting out in the garden for an afternoon and watching everything come into the sunshine and count their legs, um, the number of eyes they have and all the rest of it. They also have great resources for older kids as well, um, teenagers from how to tell how old a tree is without cutting it down to measuring the length of it just by looking at it. Um, and don't worry, there's plenty of teachers tips for adults there to help them learn as well. They also have independent learning ones, so sheets that will attract kids to them, the cartoons, um, and they will have little uh, information snippets in there as well. So I suppose to move on to biodiversity for everybody, um, Kilbari Nature Park is a remediated landfill closed in 2005. And since then, we've been introducing biodiversity back into it. It's located as part of Kilbari Bog, which is, uh, I suppose, of significance for a number of different species, including the reed warbler and um, aquatic species. What we've tried to do is to rewild it to a certain extent and invite nature back. Um, as part of that, there's a two kilometre circuit around it. Um, there's a number of different signage locations around it to point out what's of significance or what can be seen at each of those stops from yellow iris to kingfisher the butterflies to the the more i suppose industrial the gas flares from the old landfill the leachate pond and to explain why why they're necessary environmental um, structures for the remediated landfill um but the between the wildflower meadow and the integrated wetland, there's a lot to be seen there. Um, and we try and make it accessible to everybody. So some of the groups that we've worked with to, to do that are the Waterford Childcare Committee. Um, we developed with them a leaflet on how to play and explore with your kids inside in the, the park. And that goes through a range of different age groups from toddlers up. And it's really, I suppose, just to, to try and grow an appreciation for what's all around us. We also work with WIT's uh, Festival of Outdoor Science every May to do workshops in the park to bring people in and um, do a walk and talk for what can be seen and heard and it's always a really good festival every year. Kilbari Nature Park is also an accredited, an accredited Science Foundation Ireland Discovery Primary Science and Maths Centre, which is a bit of a mouthful. But what it basically means is um, it's a centre that's been accredited to bring primary schools into um, to look all around them and see, I suppose, experience firsthand, touch and uh, hear science all around them. So the workshop that we run there brings the class around the park. So we, we do questions and answers pointing out what can be seen depending on the time of the year. There's a huge variation. The teasel might be bare or it could be in full bloom. It could be um, trying to get the kids to identify trees from sticks on the, you know, without leaves to um, looking at how they're blossoming in the springtime. So we go around and we look at everything from the, the wetlands to the wildflower meadow. We also take them around to the stack, the gas flare and explain what that's about, how your waste doesn't just disappear once you throw it in your bin. And uh, it fi finishes in um, using the swatches that Bernie was talking about to identify what's actually in the wildflower meadow, what they can see flying around, um, if they can see any traces of animals. And we also get them to discuss what the impacts could be of litter left in the park. Um, if somebody was to start a fire in the gorse there, that kind of thing. 
Um, as part of our waste prevention programme, then we also have greener gardening guides developed with this south, southern waste region. And that looks at how to how to mind your garden and manage it, uh, nurture it without using chemicals. Um, so that looks at lawn care, how to tackle your pests, um, how to use insects to your benefit instead of your garden's detriment. Um, it also looks at composting and I suppose using the rain to water your garden. So it's, it's a really neat little guide. It's available at mywaste.ie or by request from the Environment Department in Waterford City and County Council. There's also been a cleaning guide to go along that. So it's about non-hazardous cleaning um, as well. So the two together are really neat uh, way to help biodiversity. One of the I suppose the most current campaigns that we're running is the Let Dandelions Be campaign. It's due to kick off next week. Um, and it's it's the laziest campaign I've ever run, I have to say. It's just doing nothing. So if you don't mow your lawn and you just let the dandelions grow, it's probably the best thing that you can do for bees at this time of the year. Dandelions count for one of the most important food sources for bees when they're coming, um, when they're waking up in the springtime, if you can just leave the dandelions grow for the first couple of months of spring, March and April, it's of huge benefit to the bees. We'll be running a competition as part of that. And it's just to take a snap photo of dandelions in bloom, whether it's in your garden or uh, along a grass verge where you walk your 5K route um, and send it into us at letdandelionsbe at gmail.com. And there's a chance to win a Chambers voucher. Um, so for either your choice of Dungarvan or Waterford, um, it really is the simplest thing. If you're talking about one of three things that you can do for biodiversity this year, that's genuinely one of the easiest things to do. And it's a great excuse not to lawn, mow your lawn for the, uh, the first couple of months of growth as well. Um, so I think that's me done. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ella. That's excellent. Um, can I just ask the attendees if you have any questions to pop them into the Q&A? Um, we have a few uh, are there already. We'll come back to them then after Owen's um, presentation. And as Owen is setting himself up there, um, his presentation today is titled Waterford's Partnership with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. So I'll hand you over to Owen. Thank you. Good morning. Um, sorry, apologies. I hope everyone can see that. I've titled um, this presentation this morning, Watford's Partnership with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. And ultimately, I suppose it's a, a talk through and hopefully a visual walkthrough of what we do, what we do, why we oh, do it. Oh, sorry. Would you mind if I interrupt you there? Because yes, we, we yeah, yeah. actually can't see, see. Okay. your, yeah. yeah. So if you just want I'll to- Stop, share again yeah. and end. As I, there's there's some really nice questions coming in there. So um, if if you keep them coming, yeah, um, you had it there, Owen. As I there, can you see that? No, now th there you go. Yeah. Okay, one second now. Now, how's that? Can you see, right? Okay, we'll go again. Sorry, apologies. I've titled this presentation Watford's Partnership with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. And ultimately, this is, I suppose, a talk through and hopefully a visual walkthrough of what we do in Watford parks and open spaces that, uh, um, and discussing, I suppose, the different aspects that of how we're setting out to improve um, biodiversity in Watford. So ultimately, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan is our guide. That, uh, and what is it? It is a shared plan of action supported by more than 90 governmental and non-governmental organizations with the underlying message to help pollinators and improve biodiversity. So what is it? It is a call to action to enhance the local landscape for pollinators. And secondly, a demonstration of one's biodiversity. I'm sure we all have a very good understanding, but at every opportunity, I think we should reiterate in the message that it is in the meaning of biodiversity. It refers to the variety of life on Earth encompassing the processes that sustain life, which supports human and societal needs together underpin the good health of our planet. And I think 
this particular image in the corner is very apt because if we look at it closely, we can see both the plant and animal kingdoms are holding hands interlinked around the world. But however, the human representation is detached from this. And certainly that is very much true. I suppose the reason why biodiversity is in decline because we are detached from biodiversity. In 2019, Watford City and County Council accepted that call and that call being to become an All-Ireland Pollinator Partner to support pollinators on public lands, work with community groups and schools, and again, to raise awareness of the importance of pollinators and biodiversity. Within the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, there are a number of actions. However, Waterford specifically set out to adapt and embrace the following actions, and these being alter the frequency of mowing, enhance and increase pollinator friendly planting, provide nesting habitats, reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides, raise awareness, particularly which Ella has been speaking to you about, and finally track this progress. So what is Watford's journey to age? And that's what we're ultimately going to maybe come through for the next number of slides. But certainly we can say there is no one quick solution in preventing biodiversity decline. However, Watford does play a role in being more pollinator friendly, specifically throughout Watford City, Tremor, Dungarvan, the Watford Greenway and the Kilbury Nature Park. So these taking these actions, the action of altering the frequency of mowing. And as Ella spoke to you about, let the dandelions be, we've equally embraced this initiative particularly on the outer ring road of Watford City, where we've adopted a less frequent grass cutting program, particularly coming from late March to May to Asia. And this is a great time, as Ella has discussed, to, for pollinators as they emerge from hibernation. And I often like to joke or to, to class this dandelions as almost being like McDonald's for bees, because it's a very easy and early source of food and is a, a lifesaver for pollinators in spring. Again, following that action, in Watford City, we, we have currently 78 hectares of grassed open space, which is maintained and managed by the local authority. And last year, we adopted a new contract where we put a placed a direct emphasis on biodiversity. This is the first time that Watford has, has directed this emphasis on biodiversity and engaging our contract to maintain such grassed areas for us. Alongside our frequent or less frequent mowing systems, that we've also embraced the initiative of wildflower meadows. These adopted measures include the creation of meadows to provide a more diverse species rich meadow to support insect communities. Within Dungarvan, we have embraced that initiated two hectares of coastal wildflower meadows located at Strandside Bridge and along the, the All Road, and further three hectares in urban, urban meadow environs. Within Tremor, we have currently three hectares maintained as an urban meadow. And within the Kilbury Nature Park, we have eight hectares. And when I mention urban meadow making, what it ultimately means is we let this meadow grow for the season and come the end of August, early September, we would engage a local farmer who would come and cut this as hay or silage and ultimately bale it and remove this and you can see by the little image in the corner again we have used pink plastic we've, we've recognized yes certainly the use of plastic can be seen as a threat that or a, a, as a waste but there's a particular initiative that uh, with communities that uh, developing these plastics where there's i suppose um an element of funding going towards particular uh, cancer research that uh, so at least at the very least there's a little bit of coordinated thinking in, in the use of our plastics pollinator friendly planting is another action we've become involved in and the initiatives we have adopted in this approach are all new planting locations are entailing the greatest if not all planting which is pollinator friendly again year on year within Watford we would plant in the region of 150 semi-mature trees and these are largely identified as pollinator friendly planting trees. Within the construction of the Greenway in recent years, almost 100,000 trees and shrubs were planted with, with pollinator planting in mind. Again, 
on the approaches to Dungarvan. The planting is is pollinator friendly. That we have we've adopted this initiative in recent years and come away from the traditional type of planting. And it's very much evident now in the approach to the town that there is a number of pollinator friendly planting schemes. And this transition continues into Tremor, where currently we're in the process of redesigning the Copper Coast Roundabout and the Upper Branch Road Junction. Many of our roundabouts within Watford City particularly, they are landscape maintained under sponsorship. However, in 2020, a joint initiative was undertaken with the sponsor Fairy Bush Landscaping, where this roundabout was redesigned to become a specific pollinator friendly planted roundabout. And I'm sure any of us who's commuted to and from Watford City has probably spent some time stopped at this roundabout. But certainly here's a, a fantastic image of how it did look last summer. This is, has been a great initiative, right? a full roundabout incorporated with pollinator friendly planting and a number of trees centering the, the roundabout. Other actions we have adopted have been the providing nesting habitats and raising awareness. Particularly Ella has spoken largely about this, but bee hotels have been installed along the Greenway involving the men's shed and local schools. This is ultimately colonizing new sites. And while raising awareness is primarily addressed by the National Biodiversity Data Center, Waterford Council equally raises awareness through its social media platform and environmental awareness campaigns. With the net result, the increasing of a more diverse public space in County Waterford. The action of reducing the use of pesticides and ultimately pesticides is a family of herbicides, insecticides and fungicides. So in 2020, we set ourselves an objective to reduce the requirement of herbicides in the means of control of unwanted weed growth, focusing on the highly public areas, that being our parks and urban, urban centres. Analyse the most fitting method for our requirements, that being the mechanical methods or sustainable herbicides, and further expansion of the most appropriate method into the areas under our jurisdiction. So within Watford City, our parks from spring 2020, staff have moved to a sustainable herbicide containing pelargonadic acid. This being a sustainable plant origin data from sunflower and rapeseed with no residual activity. Equally, one application was carried out within our city centre in early June, where the outcome of all of this has been all future applications to control unwanted weed growth within our city parks shall be completed using sustainable herbicides such as the pelargonatic acid. Within Tremor, the town centre curbside, curbside weed control consists currently of three applications per growing season. And in 2020, two of these applications were completed using mechanical means as a direct alternative to the use of the pelargonatic acid in the city. Within Dungarvan, in Walton Park and the town centre, a non-glyphosate product has been used to control unwanted weed growth, which again has no residual activity. And the outcomes from all of this the pelargonatic acid, a sustainable herbicide, is currently more achievable method for weed control, which is currently now being rolled out for 2021. And again, with the control of Japanese knotweed, which is another direct threat to biodiversity, we have interpreted that traditional herbicides remain as an effective product for its control, and owing to this fact, will remain in place into 2021. Progress tracking. Ultimately, there is no point, probably there's a very little need in taking these actions if we can't track this progress. So what has been our progress tracking of, 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 of late? In 2020, Watford attained Green Flag Award status for two amenities in Watford City and County. These have been the Green Flag Award Scheme, which is an international mark of quality, which recognises the efforts of local community engagement with green space involvement. And those two amenities have been the Kilbarry Nature Park, which Ella has spoken to you about, and the Greenway, the Waterford Greenway, which have been awarded the Antashka Green Flag Award for parks and green spaces. Alongside that, Waterford Kilbarry Nature Park has 
received the highly commended Parks for Pollinator Dead Award for the preservation of pollinating insects. So this has been a fantastic result. This is ultimately, I suppose, shown to us that, and that we are achieving data uh, and we're moving in the right direction. That, uh, so the, these, these results are great news to, 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 to hear. And as we roll into 2021, certainly our minds must wonder right, and what are our next initiatives? How are we going to uh, achieve further success in preserving biodiversity? One initiative which is currently under consideration that has been the temporary meadows within Waterford City. And these can ultimately be classed as large green areas of suitable housing estates, which have been left to grow as a temporary meadow, while still allowing adequate open space for gameplay and recreation. You may remember, if you're living in the Waterford region, that these have been introduced due to restrictions late last year and in, in the early part of the summer. And examples of these would include Ballygunner, there's a large field at the junction of the Gwales Skull, but in Cherry Mount, a large green area at the bottom of the estate, flanking the Tremor Road, and in the Ferrybank region in, the, in Rockingham. Again, we have large green areas there. And when I speak about temporary meadows, ultimately where we move through a process of building confidence with the residents of these estates, we would interpret the design being these meadows would remain in place until the school summer break and then return to the traditional lawn sense for the summer season. This would be again another method of introducing and improving biodiversity within these areas that, and bringing the public that, to a greater understanding of the importance of their green areas within their estates. And finally, if I leave you, I came across this uh, caption from an article in, in the Guardian some recent times. I think it, it, it's, it's very true and very apt that uh, because ultimately we need to shake out the outda outdated social stigma that comes from having our lawn a few centimetres longer than our neighbours. And more importantly, local authorities like Watford are unlikely to reduce the intensive management of spaces without a change in public attitude and embrace a messier great grassland. So my message today would be to you to bring that message further afield and let us embrace that messier grass, grassland. And ultimately, we can achieve greater results in preserving and improving the biodiversity of Walford. Thank you. Thanks very much, Owen. And that's that's a great note to, um, to end on there. Anne has commented that last year it was a joy to drive the Outer Ring Road as the verges were full of colour and there was a huge amount of bird life as was in evidence too. So that's just um, comment as that the, the measures that, that were taken in Waterford Council are certainly visible. Um, we have a range of questions there. Um, if Sinead, if, if you're okay to go through them. Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, so I, to start with the first question, somebody wants to know where they can get more information on the Let the Dandelions Be campaign. So I presume that's aimed at Ella first. Yeah, I'm actually, I should have said that. Thanks for asking that question. There's more information on letdandelionsbe.ie and we'll also have it out on our social media and our own website, the Council's website from next week. We'll be launching that campaign and the, competi the competition then, but there's permanent information on letdandelionsbe.ie. Perfect. And then the next one, I suppose, is a bit more general. Why do we use chemicals to treat weeds and what alternatives are there? I'm sure that's one for me. Um, I suppose, why do we treat, ultimately, that we've come from a past day to presence of where um, every environment has been sterile, that, uh, that we've, we've almost accepted or wanted that this change. And as, as I put in my, my quote that, uh, at the very end of the, the presentation, that uh, we need to change that public perception, that uh, it's okay to have a little bit of weed. It's 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 it doesn't need to be a sterile environment. That uh, um, and un until we embrace that, that gives us the, the local authority the power that uh, to change away from those regimes. That uh, um, pesticides, again, everything is is is, is regulated. That uh, they have been used that, uh, for for many years. That uh, but certainly it's the over reliance. That uh, it's it's the it's the the unfortunate nature of of going straight to that toolbox almost. That uh, 
And we need to change that thinking to, to, and, and come away from it, not let it be the first resource, to, to let it be the last resource, to, to, uh, failing all other methods. To, to, it's then we should use the pesticide state. Um, so if we can make those changes, that would, that's what will make a great change in, in, in Waterford. Okay, perfect. Um, then the next one is, um, how do you get Science Foundation Ireland Discover Centre accreditation and what facilities are required to qualify for this? Um, I suppose there's a range of discovery centres accredited from zoos to aquariums. Um, you apply through the Science Foundation Ireland to become a centre. Um, there's no facilities as such required. They come and they, um, I suppose, they, it's their, your workshop and the education that they're accrediting. So if you can, you apply with it, the application form and if they deem that you've, I suppose, ticked all the boxes, they'll come out and personally experience the workshop with you. And if, um, they're happy with that they'll credit you so it's, it's well worth getting in touch with them if you're interested and then the next one is um what's the council's policy on when to consult to communicate with the public regarding projects and when do they not do this so I, I can take that, I suppose, as the communications officer. Um, we do have a consultation portal on our website. Um, we would have a policy to consult. Um, it certainly would be our, our primary. Um, it would be our primary intention. Um, and yeah, I suppose as we, you know, between social media and our website and our interaction with the print and broadcast media as well we um you know we would have quite a good um presence in in the media and online so i hope that answers the the, the panelist question or the attendees question yeah i think so yeah and then the next one is about the trees in, that were cut down in dungarvan um when are they going to be replaced and how many tree replacements will there be If it's appropriate, um, I think there's a there's another forum for that question. Maybe they, okay. they, it, it it may not be as relative to this morning's discussion. They, to, it might be a better addressed uh, elsewhere. If, but certainly there's 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 initiatives in place they, to, to complete this. Um, somebody's just wondering: Are the leaflets presented by Ella available for online for download, and particularly the garden ones? I think you had said that they were on mywaste.ie, was that right? Very good, Sinead, yeah. The, both the gardening, greener gardening and greener cleaning are on mywaste.ie to download or view. Or if somebody is unable to download them, we have copies to send out as well. And I, I, there's a general email for Waterford Council, which is contact at waterfordcouncil.ie. So if there's any specific questions or um, requests, certainly that is managed by the customer service staff and can be passed on to the relevant person. That's contact at waterfordcouncil.ie. OK, there's one here uh, about frog. A frog has appeared in their bucket of rainwater in the garden and he comes and goes. What, I sh what should she do to help him? Anyone on knowledge of frogs? <laughs> sorry, sorry, the question was tonight, a frog appears. A frog has appeared in their bucket of rainwater in the garden and he just pops in and out, but she just wants to know, is there anything else you could do to help the frog? Yeah, I mean, if, if you have space, um, it, it, obviously if you, have, if you have a big garden, it'd be great to create a wildlife pond. No, I know that's a bit ambitious, but you know, obviously the, the, more, the, the more diversity of habitats you have in your garden and particularly wetlands, you'll see, you'll attract things like frogs and they can reproduce their, you know, they can have, um, you'll see the frog spawn. But yeah, obviously frogs will, I mean, they don't always need to be in wetlands. They, they will use grassland as well. Um, but, but the generic principle is the more diverse habitats you have, the more wildlife you'll see. Okay, perfect. Then there's one here about uh, wondering what to do if we leave our lawn to grow without cutting it in the summer. Should we cut it in the winter or leave it? And does it rot if it's not cut? If I, yeah, I can take that. Um, ultimately, yes, yes, you should, you should cut at the end of the season. That, uh, it's very important to remove that growth, that year's growth. That, uh, um, and Cut it quite low, they, to open it up, let the soil breathe. They, to, but certainly 
for the wildflowers to revigorate and regrow and for the seeds they to the drop they to, uh, particularly our, our annuals they to, you would cut possibly they to early September, leave it lie for seven to 10 days, let that she seed fall back down to the soil surface, they to remove all that unwanted vegetation, they to compost it, they to, uh, and then you begin the process again for the following spring. They to, but it's, it's hugely important they to, and you may have seen in, in, in my slides they to, the urban hay meadow making data. This is hugely important they to, for the, the preservation of these meadows they to, and to ensure they to, the continuation and the, the strengthening of the meadows, that the vegetation, the current year's vegetation is removed at the end of the year. So it's replicating traditional farming senses. They to, and if you can do that in your in your home garden or your front garden, they to, this is replicating that, and that is what is ensuring they to, the 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 vigoration and the regrowth in the following springtime. Perfect. And the next one is actually a question I could ask myself. It's I have a small town garden which is mostly paved, um, and a lot of it is clay, and there's no grass growth. What could I encourage to do to encourage biodiversity in my garden? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you can always get um, uh, planters, you know, so even if you don't have the whatever bare earth, I mean, you can introduce loads of planting with planters. So things like lavender um, are fantastic. Um, they're magnets for, for butterflies and bees and obviously, you know, a beautiful thing to have in, in your, your area anyway. Um, so yeah, if you go on the pollinators.ie website, and as I said, there's, there's lists of planting codes there. So really useful. Um, so you can go fully equipped into your garden center and explain you know, what site you have and say, I want species X, Y, and Z that, that are you know, easily maintained and that, that can grow well in planters. And then you, know, you can move them around. You kind of create a mobile garden. Um, you know, so you can have different, different size pots and different tiers of planting. And, um, you know, and just, just wait and see you know, in the summer um, like what, how much insects are attracted. And the Biodiversity Day Center have this great thing um it's called the the uh, the flower insect timed count so basically what you do you can do it in your rows of planters or on the grass and you you look at um you look at a, a square meter over i think it's 10 minutes and you count the number of insects that are attracted to those plants and you know it, it's quite staggering actually and it just reflects i suppose what you know if you just make a little effort um the the rewards that you you reap perfect uh, that's what uh, well, the next one is how have you any plans to encourage beekeeping in suburban areas? Oh, I suppose not at present <laughs> is no. the only answer to that. Not at present. Um, I know the East Waterford and West Waterford beekeepers are very active. We don't have any plans as such at present, no. And uh, somebody here wants to know, the cops say that the dandelion campaign is brilliant, but they want to know, would we support following with a clover growing campaign? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Look into it. Yeah. And we've incorporated some clover planting within Dungarvan. Uh, and again, within Kilbarry Nature Park, they, uh, particularly the red and white clover. They, uh, so these are fantastic resources for the bees throughout the, the, the latter summer months. They, uh, um, and and clover is a, almost a repeat flowering day, so it's it's a huge advantage day. To, um, but certainly within Dungarvan and Kilbarry Nature Park, day to, there is large tracts of clover, and we're continuously trying to increase it day to, uh, into our, our grassed areas. Okay, I have somebody said last spring they saw a lot of dead bees along the road, and they're just wondering is planting bee friendly plants on road verges around roundabouts dangerous for bees? Um, it's a difficult question. That, you know, I don't know if there's any direct surveys to indicate that, the correlation that, of, of bees, that, but certainly, um, uh, look, that, uh, you're going to find wherever there's passing traffic, that, uh, that a car moving at whatever speed, that, uh, uh, if, if, if bees are intercepting that pathway, that, uh, you're going to have a strike. That, uh, but certainly, I suppose, what is very common, if we remember back to a number of years ago, it would have been very common on, on, the, on our windscreen, the number of flies and insects that you would see on a summer's evening that unfortunately would have come a cropper. But um, planting directly, look, they, they, it's certainly, I suppose, it's most important that we increase our planting, they, they, pollinator planting, which is a food source, they, they, wherever it be. 
that uh, um, that's probably the underlying that or the, the, the most important initiative that uh, um, do we know has it a direct impact there is certainly but we have in an urban area that we should take every opportunity to increase our pollinator planting data so at least that we give the bee every opportunity they to to, to uh, remain intact data in, in in urban settings okay that's perfect thanks so um we could be here asking questions all day they keep flying in but i'll just give two quick one two quick ones if that's okay with you um somebody just wants to know how can we manage people's expectations about wildflowers looking like weeds rather than the beautiful you know annual bedding plants that we had before certainly and that that is that is our challenge and 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 hopefully today's event is the road to to creating that data um it's communication data it's it's i suppose advertisement data and certainly data success like the the green flag awards data demonstrate that it is okay to be a little bit messier it is data uh, something we should embrace that it is for not necessarily data for us entirely that it's for the future data because i suppose within horticulture everything you do is with one eye on the future data it's not always in today's present world state we must we must think about the future data um, and if we don't if we don't make these changes it will come to a stage where it will be too late data but certainly if everyone here today can take that message and embrace it and spread it that uh, the biodiversity does mean a little bit that uh, messier that ever as i described it but that is a good thing that uh, and certainly it will become fashionable that and if we can make that fashionable that will be good for biodiversity that's perfect yeah i think i've seen a few people have made that comment in the chat already that that's their one takeaway today and just lastly then bernadette somebody wants to know how you get those lovely gardening for diversity resources yeah, so if people want to email me, um, so my email address is bguest uh, at waterfordcouncil.ie and we'll pop them in the post to you. So I think we still have some left from last year, but it's going to be um, a new print run because I know they're very popular and um, so they're, they're just very practical. And if people could do three things, that would be a great achievement out of this. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll come back then. Um, I have a comment there from Luke and Tidy Towns just to say that cynics would say the councils are just being lazy and using biodiversity as an excuse for doing less work. Um, so I suppose the question that that poses is how do we overcome this attitude? Um, thank you all for your questions um, and thank you to the three panelists for, for your input. Um, we will be emailing a recording of today's um, of today's workshop to you. Um, so you should receive that later. And there'll also be a list of useful websites that we'll send to you as well. Um, there's a number of other events happening this week. Tomorrow at 11, you can discover the new digital wildlife um, map of Ireland with its creator, Neil Tarrant. And that can be accessed on, on nature.librariesireland.ie. Thursday at 11, we'll have a pre-recorded piece with the birds, the bees, the flowers, and the trees trees biodiversity and that is with ecologist Nemi P. Grace O'Sullivan and that can be found on the Europe Direct Facebook page um, and there's another event then on Friday at 11 where you can learn to spot spring flowers and become a citizen scientist with Oshin Duffy um, from the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Um, so thank you all. And we just, I suppose we, we want to thank Europe Direct as well, um, which, uh, which is run from Central Library in Waterford. And it's a network of local contact points that serve as a direct link between citizens and the EU institutions. And Europe Direct Waterford aims to show people and organizations how the EU is relevant in their lives, offer information and to facilitate connections. Um, so on that, I would again like to thank you. We will certainly look at your questions um, that we haven't got around to today and for ourselves as a local authority, I suppose, take those, bear those in mind um, and, and take them on board. So that is it. And thank you very much for your, um, for your attendance today.